All right, this episode is near and dear to my heart, and I'm not going to lie, I'm I'm kind of fuming right now, I'm a little pissed off right now, and so this is right where I want to be for this podcast, Entitled Little Brats. That's what we're going to be talking about today, Entitled Little Brats. And what I mean by that is all the workforce talent that's coming up right now that we can't stand. And if you are under the age of 30, I am talking about you, and I pray And if you're listening to this podcast, you're already trying to get better, so it's probably not you, but I do pray that you are taking steps to make yourself better and fit into the workplace because, man, this generation that's coming up are so entitled, it's killing me. Why do I say that? It's very simple. I ran an ad for a guy in the shop. The ad got three hits over a week. Rewind 10 years ago, I would have gotten 20, 25 hits. It would have taken me a day, day and a half to do all the interviews. Said I got three. You know how many people showed up for the interview? One. Two people actually called me, had a conversation with me. They made it past stage one. They moved to stage two, which is I want to meet them in person. And they set up a time and they no-showed. How many people right now have you had a no-show on? How many people have no-showed on you? How many people just said, nah, we're not going to do this. We don't care. We're not going to fill up. That blows my mind. I don't know where they were trained. I don't know where they were taught. I don't know what the parents are doing these days. But how can you, even in your conscience, not show up for an interview that you set up where you're actually going there and saying, hey, if I show up and do this job, you will pay me money. You will give me dead presidents if I just show up. And even then they're like, nah, I don't want it. That blows my mind. So I want to talk about what we're doing to combat the lack of talent in the workplace. That's what I want to talk about on this podcast. This is podcast number three. I have so many stories. I can't even begin to tell you. And they're not just everyone's stories. I I got them in my own four walls. Here's a perfect example inside my own four walls. So I have four kids. My oldest son just turned 16. We turned 16 about six, seven, or seven months ago. I don't know about you guys, but when I was younger, I was drooling to get my driver's license. At 15 and a half, I had already got my permit. I was begging my parents to drive. My parents had a 1982 beige Volvo. Uh, yeah, you know, we were super sporty. Uh, just a beige Volvo, a square box, and I couldn't wait to drive that thing, a little inline four-cylinder, and we drove all over town. And everyone like, can I drive? Can I drive? Can we go to the store? Can I drive? Can I drive? And it was all I wanted to do was drive. I made an appointment on my birthday the day I turned 16 to get a driver's license and go take my test so I could actually drive. I was drooling for this. My son, 15 and a half. Hey, when do you want to go get your permit? Oh, no. Well, you're going to be turning 16 soon. So? Well, don't you want to get a driver's license? Eh. Could care less. And he's not alone. He's not alone out there. All this generation coming up. We go to the high school to pick up the kids. And there's no student parking lot. It doesn't even exist. There's like 20 cars. We had over 300 cars when I graduated high school of the student parking lot. We had to fight for the dirt spots in the back when you first got your license as a sophomore. And now 30 cars tops for the entire school for students. What is happening? The lack of drive is what's happening. And it's blowing my mind. I don't even understand. I don't get it. But as all great owners, we're going to need to adapt. But... I don't even want to talk about adapt right now. I don't want to bring the solution to the table. I still got a vent here because this much is just pissing me off. Personal days. I had, a, I had a new employee like four months ago go, well, how many personal days do I get? And I'm like, well, they're called vacation and they career after a year. He goes, yeah, the vacation is fine before we go on long trips, but how many personal days do I get? I said, that's the same as a vacation. He goes, well, you know, if like there's snow on the mountains and we want to go snowboarding, I can just call you up in that morning and say, I'm taking a personal day. How many of those do I get? I literally had to stop him, stare at him and say, That's called PTO or paid time off, and it's the same as vacation. The words are interchangeable, and you don't get separate buckets for those. And he still just looked at me like he was in shock, like, why don't I get personal days? I don't understand it. And then I asked him, I said, on these personal days, am I paying you for those days? And he goes, well, yeah, it's like a personal development day. And I couldn't help myself. I had to go down the rabbit hole. I said, okay, what am I getting out of you snowboarding? And he goes, well, I'm happy. And I said, well, I'm not happy. And I said, can you tell me why I'm not happy in this situation? And he, he literally looked at me and goes, I don't know. And he said, I don't know, just like my son says, I don't know. And if you're a father, you know that your blood pressure just raises like 10 octaves, like right off the bat. You're like, oh, I'm going to strangle your little neck. 
And I had to, of course, you know, it's not my son. It's at the workplace. I got to keep composure. And I say, well, I'm losing money and you're not producing anything from me. So therefore, this isn't a good deal to me. So no, you don't have any personal days. And then he had the audacity to go, well, is something you can think about in the future that maybe we can get them next year? And I said, tell you what, why don't you work really, really hard and I'll reward you with an incentive. And I'll give you one personal day if you work really hard and you make me a lot of money on a certain project I didn't think I was going to make that much money on. I said, then maybe we'll talk about a personal day. And he went, that's a lot of work. I couldn't. I fired him. I couldn't. I couldn't take the blind flank anymore. I just, I said, you know what? I don't think this is a good place for you to work anymore. I think you have talents, but I think you need to go somewhere else. And I just let him go. I literally did. I, I walked right into my accounting office where, you know, when you're a smaller company, it's accounting and HR. And I said, can I give his final pie checks? Give me his COBRA notice. You know, we're here in California, so we have so many rules and regs here. And I just hand his paperwork and I said, you're ready to go. And he, and he looked and he said, okay. And he's got his check. And all he saw was the dollar signs on that check. And he was so excited to leave. If you were born before 1990, you know that you have some problems. You know that I don't have a job anymore. I got to pay for things. I, what am I going to do? How am I going to collect money? I have, you know, rents due. There's car insurances due. All these things are due. This kid had not a care in the world. He was just pumped. He had a check in his pocket. He was going to get a burrito and life was good. And I'm just so blown away at that. I have, I got another one for you. The trailer incident. I call it the trailer incident. You watch all my employees like part like the Red Sea when I say the trailer incident. Because they know how pissed off I was on this one. We had an old dual axle trailer. It was an open, open trailer that was 18 footer. And we go ahead and, and we've had, I mean, the thing was just a dinosaur. And I said, okay, we're going to go buy a new trailer. It's going to be a beautiful trailer. We'll get it brand new. We'll, we'll just go get it. And, it. and we're talking $3,800 here. It's not we're breaking the bank, but it's just the old trailer worked. We're really buying the new trailer for Ego, but I wanted a nice looking trailer to show our clients that we have good equipment and we take pride in the, the equipment that we have. So I went and got a new trailer. It's beautiful. It's blue. It's the same corporate colors as our company. It's all set up. A week and a half later, after getting the trailer and getting it back, we have a new hire. It's about a week old. And we have some stuff that needs to go to the recycling. And so I go to the recycle. I would tell him, I go, hey, do you know how to drive a trailer? And he says, yes, I do. I said, Are you don't need to lie to me. Do you know how to drive? He goes, not a problem. Been driving for years. Okay. So we give him the keys. We go to the trailer. We put all the stuff in recycling. And he drives a mile and a half down the road. He goes to the recycling place. He comes back. There's a divot, a dent in the angle iron right near the bumper where he jackknifed the trailer and bent the trailer and bent the bumper of the truck. I come back, I look, I said, what are you doing? He goes, oh, it's really tight. I said, you no, you back up. So I'm fuming there was a dent. I say, look, this is how you got to do it. And I send one of my other rookie guys and I say, go with him. I said, you know how to drive a trailer? He goes, not really. I said, then just get out and, and look around, make sure he doesn't jackknife the trailer again. They come back. And he jackknifed the other side of the trailer. I had matching dents on both sides of the trailer. I look at both of them. I go, what the hell happened? To which they go, the forklift driver hit it when he picked up the sign. I said, well, then that's not your problem. That's the recycling problem. Get in my car, go down the recycling place. said, hey, what happened with the trailer? Guy goes, I was waiting for you to come back here. I said, yeah. And he goes, we got to show you what happened. He pulls up the video camera. And the kid jackknifed the trailer a second time on the same side he did. So I didn't see. It was already bent. I didn't know it was more bent. Then jackknifed the other side. And the guys in recycling were actually coming out, trying to direct him and tell him how to do the trailer. To which he said, I got it. Don't worry. Boss doesn't care about this trailer. Literally, his words on the camera, boss doesn't care about this trailer. So I come back. Not only did they make me look like an idiot, made me look like a liar, but they lied just because they felt like it. Did he get canned that day? 100% he did. I think it was my worst firing ever. I literally looked at him in the face and said, you're fucking fired. And I just gave him his check. I think I threw it at him. I was so pissed. Not my finest moment as an owner, but Jiminy Christmas. Destroyed my trailer, dents all over it. The paint's chipping now, and it's a week and a half old because the kid lied. <laughs> We're talking about integrity. We're talking about talent in the workforce. Where is it? Well, I'm going to tell you that there are diamonds in the rough. And as owners, we do need to adapt. I hate to say it, but we do have some dinosaur tendencies that we are bringing back in the workplace as the new people are coming around. Number one, the whole entire company works from seven to three. I hate to tell you this, but that's kind of an archaic model now. 
your whole team doesn't need to be there at 7 a.m., work, and then leave at 3 p.m. Or whatever lunches are, maybe 4 p.m. if you're actually doing math here, you're listening to me. But what it is is flexible schedule is not a bad thing. Some can start at 7, some can start at 6, some can start at 8. If they get their job done and it's not pertinent to the actual project to be there at a certain time, a flexible schedule is going to get you that bigger talent pool. The smart people that are out there, and I know they're far and few between, but the smart people that are out there, they're going to be looking for those little incentives that are non-monetary. As much as I hate to say this, the American dream is somewhat dead. The new generation that's coming up doesn't have the white picket fence and the, and the, the beautiful family and the 2.5 kids. They don't want that. They're just trying to live and have fun and experience the moment. You know, everybody's trying to be a social media star these days because they think that's where all the money's from. They don't know it's fake money. You know, all that fun stuff that goes with it. But they're not really applying themselves for the most part. But that's few. The diamonds in the rough are. And they're looking for non-monetary intangibles that they can go, this is awesome. I get this. The really smart ones, medical insurance. You pay for the medical. You pay for their medical insurance. And in turn, they don't have to pay for that. It doesn't come out of their pocket. Expensive to the owner, but you're going to actually grab more of the talent pool that's out there and bring them into your four walls. A latte machine. I just shoot me as soon as the words came out of my mouth, but I got to say it, a latte machine. I walked into a property management company and the property manager guy that's been there forever. I mean, he was close to retirement. He goes, Aaron, I said, what? He goes, you're not going to believe this shit. I said, what? And he goes, we put a latte machine in the break room. I said, does anybody even know how to use it? He goes, yeah, all the younger generation does. Us old geezers, we don't have a freaking clue. He goes, but the younger generation does. And he goes, and they love it. And we actually hired two really good property managers because we have a latte machine. I said, you got to be kidding me. He goes, Aaron, I don't know what the world's coming to, but that's what got him. We flat out walked him around the place and they saw the latte machine. And they took the job. So am I telling you to get a latte machine? Maybe, maybe that's a trick that you're going to get to get that better talent pool that's out there. Another way to adapt, change your interview questions, change your interview questions. I only ask two questions in an interview. I take that back three. I take, I, I do three and I'm going to tell them to you right now. Question number one, and it's a long word problem and I give it to him printed on a piece of paper and I'm not going to read the whole thing to you right now, but it's basically four guys come to a bridge and it's dark at night. Only two guys can cross at lunch with a flashlight. You got to get all three guys or all four guys over inside of 17 minutes. One guy's 10, one guy's uh, five, one guy's two and one guy's one. How can they get over in 17 minutes? There's no tricks to this. There's no, you throw the flashlight, one carries another, and there's no tricks. It is straight for as it come. There's not one trick to this. I've been asking this question for 10 years and nobody has ever gotten it right. So you're asking yourself, hey, Aaron, why are you asking this question if no one gets it right? Because I don't care about the answer. So when you go into an interview, I'm gonna, I'm gonna teach you something right now. You're gonna like this. Listen up real closely on this one. People put on their best face when they go to an interview. They smile at everything, even though they may never smile another day in their lives. They say yes, and they agree with you. They laugh and joke with you. They are on their best behavior. It's almost like they're trying to date you. And as soon as you hire them, you start to see the real person. So you got to hone your interview skills in such a way that you can see who the real person is. So I'm going to teach you right now. If you ask that question with an impossible answer, what you're looking for is, how do they sweat? How do they handle stress? How do they handle something when the person that's judging them is watching them and they're not getting it right? That right there is the whole reason why I asked that question. And I love it because you can never, ever fake it. You can't fake it. You can't dial that in. You are just going to be who you are as a person. So imagine this. They give you a word problem. You feel like you're in fourth grade. They give you a pen. And you read this word problem, you start filling it out, and they're just staring at you. And they're just staring at you, just, just giving you those dagger eyes saying, why isn't it done yet? And you can't get it done. And you can just, you just feel the anxiety, the hairs on the back of your neck stand up, and you just, you, you know, your stomach turns a little bit, and you're like, oh, God, what am I going to do? I got to. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, how you handle stress is going to pop out, and you can't even hide it. No kidding. I'm not joking. I literally had one guy flat out look at me and go, you know, I got really high last night, so I don't think my brain's working right now. 
well, we have a drug test, sir, so there's the door. I literally had one guy admit that. I had another guy take the piece of paper and shove it right back at me after 30 seconds. Yeah, I don't do word problems. To cover up his insecurity, he bolstered up and threw it back at me like, I'm too good for this. Well, what if you give him a very stressful project a week from now? What's he going to do? Tell you I can't do it and throw it back at you? Now he's a worthless employee because you're doing all the work that you wanted him to do. So that guy's not any good. My favorite employees, the ones that I've hired and are still with me to this day, are the employees that look at that problem. After five or six minutes, I can see how they handle stress. And I say, move on to question two. And you know what they do? They go, I'm not done with question one. May I have more time? That's the best answer ever. Think about it. You give them a very hard challenge at the company. And they stick with it till they get it done. That's the employees you want in your four walls. That's the talent you want. Now you don't got to worry about if they're good or not. You get to see it right there in the interview because they're handling their stress appropriately and sticking with the problem. For the ones that I do say, move on to question two, and they say, okay. And I've had a couple say, can I come back? I've had, actually had people say, can I take this home and work on it until I get it right and call you when I get the answer? Those are my home run. Those are my home run interviews. I, I usually you know, offer them a job on the spot almost because they have what it takes to stick with the problem. Question number two. How much does the U.S. consume of skim milk in a given year? How much does the U.S. consume of skim milk in a given year? Again, I don't give a crap about the answer. I want to see how you handle it. My horrible answers. I got this answer. I, I literally was, I, it, it took everything to do not to start busting up laughing right in front of this guy's face. He looked at me. And I said, read it out loud and tell me the tools that you need to answer this question. And he looks at me and he goes, zero, I don't drink skim milk. What? <laughs> so, oh, so we just take skim milk, we make it, we put it in the refrigerators, inside the supermarkets, and then we just throw them after two weeks because no one drinks skim milk. It's just, you know, a ploy to look like the shelves are full. That's, that's why there's skim milk. Give me a break. So that man looked at life through a keyhole. He, he, he didn't know how to look at anything else other than from his point of view. Well, that's a horrible employee. I don't want him on my team. These are the A-plus answers. Are you talking commercial or commercial and residential? Well, that's awesome. I'm talking both. The entire U.S. commercial, okay? Because commercial, you got, you got, you know, for coffee, you got for lattes, you got that. I know in hospitals, some people can only drink skim milk because of X, Y, Z reasons. Uh, skim milk is one of the ones that it doesn't fire off lactose intolerance. And, the, and people that start thinking about what they've learned throughout their lifetime. So they have a picture of the whole view, and then they start drilling it down to who actually uses the skim milk out of the, what, the six or seven different milks that are out on the category. And then they make up a number. They go, well, how many people are on the, in the population of the U.S.? Okay, well, how many people are this? How many people are that? And they start asking questions. I don't care about the answer. How are they attacking the problem? Macro than micro? Those things you can't hide when you do an interview. You can't hide them. It's who you are is who you are. So I want you guys to hone your interview skills a little bit better, and you're going to find the talent in the people that you have versus them giving you the generic answers. Now, my third question is very basic. It's very vanilla compared to those two, but I ask it for a simple reason. If I could give you any job in the world, any job in the world, and they all pay the same, baseball player, poet, landscaper, and they all paid exactly the same dollar amount, every single job paid exactly $100,000 a year, what job would I give you that when you got up every morning, you were excited to go to work? What job could I give you? And sometimes they say the job that they're applying for, which we all know is BS, because that's not their maiden job, or they would have been like super pumped and just you know skipping down the hallway as they came for the interview. That's it's a lie. Come on now, they're trying to tell me what I want to hear. And I always tell them, I say, no, 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 not what I want to hear. Tell me what you truly love, and I'm going to tell you why. Here you go. It happened to me. It's exactly what happened. I asked this question about 11 years ago, and this gentleman said, "I love to tinker. I love to take things apart, see what it's how it built, how it works, and then put it all back together." I love to tinker. I ended up hiring him to program the machines outside for cutting all the metal. He would make the most intricate pieces fit. He would dovetail aluminum like you do on wood. He would make some weird jigsaw puzzle. They all fit together with one locking mechanism. He spent hours taking something that should take 15 minutes. Why? 
because he loves to tinker. Whatever you want to do in this world is exactly what you are going to dive and drive and put yourself into. You are somehow going to go right there. I'm transparent. I'm an open slate. I love to teach. I love to educate. I love to give somebody the best tool possible in their bag so they can excel. Believe it or not, I like wrenching on my kids' motorcycles more than I like riding motorcycles because that bike is set up perfectly for them and they can have that extra edge and go that much faster. I love to educate. So I'm sitting here talking on the podcast. I love to do that. So therefore, I am going to find my niche on what I love to do. Every single one of your employees is already have a niche of what they love. You may know some of them. You may not. Find them out. But as you hire and you interview, make sure they love that particular style job or else they're not going to be a good fit. All right, we're adapting. We're trying to find this talent pool that's out there. The last thing I want to talk to you guys about, working with your star employees. So once you bring this raw talent in, you go, all right, he's got the bones. She's got the bones, the basics of there. Now I need to mold this person, this great employee. Because that's what we have to do. There's a small talent pool out there. So we got we to gotta hone them, make them beautiful. So how we're going to do that is you work with your best ones. Sounds backwards, right? You want to work with your, your bad employees and bring them back up to par. It's actually a horrible idea. You work with your best talent, the ones that are already your all-stars. Because the ones that are all-stars are already primed. They already have the right vision. They already know they want to learn more. They're already doing everything that you want. They are primed for more growth. Don't let your own mind of what average is stop you. If you think they're producing 100 widgets a day is good and somebody does 120, and they go, oh, they're doing great and another person does only 80 widgets when you want 100, don't spend the time on the 80. They already don't care. But the person that's doing 120, what if they can get to 140 or 160 or maybe 200? I bet you if you work with your really good employees, they're going to produce way more, and your time is going to be better spent there. How are you handling the good employees? Better question, how are you rewarding your good employees and making sure that your talent is awesome? So not only do you have awesome talent in your four walls, but when you hire the new ones, they want to work there too because you see all the other cool people that are working there as well. How are you rewarding the new ones? How are you getting the new ones? I want to hear all of this feedback. Please log on to YouTube. Put in the comment section. How are you rewarding your good employees? How are you dialing them in? How are you doing interview questions? You know, now you've heard a couple of mine. What any of your questions do you love? What insight does that give you? I want to hear all this on the YouTube channel. You can always find us on YouTube, uh, the AC Method. We're on Stitcher, Spotify, iTunes, all that fun stuff, all the social medias. Go ahead and uh, listen up, and away we go. I appreciate all you guys' time. You guys have a good one.